Welcome to Teacher Please, a hateful voyage of the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. I'm your co-host, Peter. How are you recovering from the holidays, Peter? Is, is the family good? Are you good? We're good. We're still low-key sick. Uh, all that stuff's still going on. I thought what I was going to have... What with the holidays? That keeps... It happened to me, too. Well, because God. I have little germ magnets called children that just bring death into my house. Uh, you know, I, I had this silly notion that with all the time off, I was going to be able to sit down and play a lot of video games, but... It was just uh, holding screaming babies, getting thrown up on, cleaning pee out of the carpet, poop out of diapers, vomit out of the carpet. It was uh, it's it's a Christmas life. wonderland. Yeah, <laughs> sounds fucking awesome. Uh, I'll tell you what I, else uh, is awesome. Oh, no, go ahead and tell me about yours. No, no, it was, it's fine. It was a lot less pee and poop, really. I mean, I'm I got that to look forward that. to. I, I got really sick did. after Christmas, kind of stunk. Uh, but you know what didn't stink? The fucking results of Halen Wellnet's uh, shorts podcast appreciation. Hope everyone's listening to that thing because uh, that was cool, man. I I got I listened to it the moment we got word that it was available, and uh, it's it's always for, I always enjoy listening to them because they got those Australian accents, so it's always very exotic. And we've mentioned that before. Let me tell you because my life right now is ruled by my daughter, and all she watches is Peppa Pig and the Wiggles. So Peppa Pig's all British, but Wiggles are Australian. And hearing you and I talk to what I can only assume are hot Australian broads, like, <laughs> it's so magic. I'm like, I'm talking to Emma Wiggle. Wow. <laughs> wow. A couple nobodies out of Ohio. And there we are laughing it up with, with Australian. It's It was magic. Like you said, it's magic. Uh, yeah, it was fun to to see how they used us, and and uh, it was extremely well produced. I always love their stuff. All the sound and and uh, production values are super high, and I can't say thank you enough that they involved us. We were happy to happy to do it. Production values, uh, we've we've said it before. Changing gears up here a little bit, we are in a golden age of sci fi and just television in general right now, and I feel so overwhelmed by how much stuff there is out there to watch right now. Um. Are you are you an expanse guy? You've tried to get me on that show a few times. I've watched like six episodes. It's just I couldn't get into it. Really? I, I usually like right like in my wheelhouse, hard sci fi, lots of politics, you know, like that whole like Battlestar Galactica sort of vibe mm -hmm. off of it. And I was ready to like it. And then I just I watched six episodes. I'm just like, this is this is not giving me a, anything to hook myself onto. So that's I'm very bail. surprising here. Well, they just put out their new season. Uh, Amazon scooped them up. So they've got the whole thing on Amazon Prime. That's cool. Man, I, Witcher just came out. Have you touched that at all yet? Yes, I I think they really nailed it. And I'm not surprised they see that critics hated it because it feels very much like a Witcher television show, which is. A lot of gratuitous violence and fucking. Oh, really? And I'd like to. Know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. You all the way long. Trust me. Um, What else is out there that we're, we're trying to get through? Uh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of really great stuff. And I just I need to find Rick and Morty. I'm not even caught up on. Um, and then, of course, Chernobyl, which we've talked about a couple of times, which solid gold A plus. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. And that was some of the best shit I've ever seen. Yeah. And that's kind of uh that was kind of my the lifeline i was hanging to throughout this episode season four episode 21 the omega directive that's interesting that's an interesting thought as to uh a direct parallel uh certainly they were attempting to make the dangerous science kind of case but do go on give me your thoughts peter i don't know what i was expecting going into this i thought it was going to be a very borg centric episode just based on some of the capsules and light discussions that we had. I really like this episode. It, it does something we don't see frequently in Voyager. And that is put Voyager, put the captain of the starship as a secondary influencer to Starfleet orders. Um, and that we haven't really seen Starfleet, be the guiding light of what happens on that ship since the Maquis were initially hunted down. Uh, so this was a really cool thought experiment episode. Uh, 
and I like the way they touch the subject material. I like the the experimentation that ends up coming in later, and that's where I say that you know Chernobyl really popped into my mind a lot during this. Uh, and I thought it was uh, it was different and it was good. I think this episode had an, a, a premise that is incredibly Star Trek. I love the idea of there being scientific endeavor that the Federation knows is so dangerous as to not be pursued. The idea of threat to the idea of space travel. That was huge. As the, as the McGuff, I, like, I think that's so cool uh, that obviously that's a thing that's so dangerous that the Federation can't afford to fuck it up. So they will do everything in their power to ensure that it doesn't happen. I appreciate the complete lack of Section 31 in all yeah. decisions made through this thing. That this is just a captains be aware we're not going to spread this knowledge because the more people know about this the more people might try and fuck with it so we're just telling the people that need to be aware that this exists so that it can be destroyed uh interest all of that's very interesting uh i think the the episode falls apart for me for a couple reasons one being janeway's characterization throughout the episode remaining so terribly inconsistent as to the point of distraction. And two, as much as I am a seven of nine fan, her shit got so tired for me in this episode that I just wanted to crawl out of my skin. I'm so ready to be out of this season when they stop just riding the fucking seven of nine train. So goddamn hard. And this just for some reason just fucking annoyed me so much that in the end, I kind of didn't like it very much. Like the episode kind of fell apart for me at the end. The forced religious stuff at the end. I'm just like, ugh, yeah, ugh. well, let's get into the details and, and start fleshing some of this stuff off. We start off with uh, seven of nine in her cargo bay coming out of uh, regeneration. And I thought it's interesting that apparently all of the captain's logs and everything else is a. Uh, recorded just by tapping the com badge and speaking out loud. Yeah, not a lot of opsec on that. everyone's <laughs> private thoughts there, you know, just chilling, you know, spouting out what you put in your log. Maybe these people over here, maybe they don't, who knows? Um, I mean, it makes sense, of course, that computers of the 24th century are complex enough that any input, I imagine, can start a computer recording that you decide to program it to. Maybe that's what seven of nine does. Sure. Who knows? We can see her vamp around her little, uh, her little alcove, as usual. My wife was watching uh, she, and said, why do her boobs look even more pronounced? Do they look different to you? And I said, I wouldn't be surprised if every episode between episodes at costume departments doing something different to her cat suit with wires and plates and whatever. You know, we don't really talk about it that much anymore, but she might not be in tinfoil anymore. But man, if that thing's not painted on it's hard not to notice every time yeah. here we are 25 years later happy anniversary this year voyager <laughs> officially 25 and it means you get a discount on your car insurance wow. and then you realize the cold inevitability of death mm -hmm. uh anyway moving on uh seven of nine then goes to the uh mess hall and pulls what i can only refer to as the biggest dick move on the planet and uh that is interrupt vulcan chess or as they call it, cow toe. Uh, so it's a callback, actually, to the whole holodeck episode when Harry and and Tuvok uh, got into a fight over uh, lizard catfish. Over a yes, the lizard catfish, and uh, and Harry wanted to learn cow toe, which is a Vulcan logic game, and and Tuvok uh, said that he would teach him, and so here they are uh, playing, and. Uh, Harry's really close to beating Tuvok or one. He just he fucking he fucking wants it. And he's just trying to find the like the last move to get there. But of course, seven of nine is just a huge bitch. So rather than allow Harry to finish, uh, you know, she can't possibly be delayed for 20 seconds. Uh, just takes the piece and puts it in the correct position to win. And I'm like, that has got to be the coldest. Like you have attempted to take the ship over like three times. You've like shot at people. This is probably 
just the worst thing I think I've ever seen her do. You've thrown Harry into security officers so hard it's knocked both of them out. And yet somehow this yes, seems worse. Just blasted them. Yeah, this seems worse. This is a calculated, contemptful gesture in a fashion that is truly devastating. I enjoyed seeing the return of this chess game. Anytime there's internal continuity, I think it's cool. I find it hard to believe that at no point Tuvok ever approached Seven about playing this game because there has to be knowledge to Tuvok that she's logical AF. Although she's sworn off logic on several occasions, I want to say. Uh, I would like to see them have that debate. I, I'd like to see that. Maybe that'll be something they get into. But uh, Probably happened during the whole year they became bros during the year of hell, and then, then they don't remember. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but on the way out, there's a conversation with Kim and Seven where they very cleverly remind everybody of just how it is that the Borg work. And when the Borg assimilates someone, they have all of that person's knowledge, which two things come out of that. One is anything that is irrelevant or not important is forgotten by the collective. And anything that is good gets kept. I thought it was interesting in this point. Obviously, they're setting up how she's going to have some information. Um, but she doesn't really seem to find value in religion or religious experiences. Yet, seven or eight times later in the episode, that comes up. Like Janeway will make a mention later on about saying that something is the holy grail of uh, the Borg. And Someone's like, what? What? What are you? What are you talking about? What is Christianity? <laughs> what? And and then meanwhile, she goes through like these like tiny myths of all of these civilizations that they've uh, assimilated. And yet somehow, some way, like the idea of Earth religions escapes her. You know, her thoughts. Like fuck, fucking whatever. Sure, because we're gonna force this fucking dialogue somehow. But the interesting part of this scene is the statement that she so her she said before she has an eidetic memory right yes that has to be borg implants right or at least a consequence of her time as a borg it's i don't know if it's it's uh cybernetic or if it's just a function of having been included in the hive mind for so long and therefore you're like your brain is trained to do it yeah um one one or the other but as a result uh, there's a mutual agreement by the both of them that she is probably the smartest human in the universe. Yes. And I thought, you know, I've never really thought about it that way. And I suppose if we're going to quantify that statement as just saying by possession of raw facts and the ability to stack those facts to draw scientific conclusions. Yes. But like, wow, what a what a statement to make. And like that really puts her character in in a different light. And I don't think Janeway would have been thinking about that when they initially decided to save her for some fucking reason. That's crazy. And do you think as a result that Picard has come out of his experience uh, as a Borg, as Locutus, as a smarter person? Uh, not in the same way. I think that seven of nine's experience of long-term Borg assimilation and therefore long-term uh exposure exposure to the hive mind and absorption into her own mental capacity of the knowledge of that hive mind is fundamentally mentally different than picard's long weekend as a borg but do you um, think that you picard's know, long weekend as a borg had an overall increase in his intelligence or knowledge no i don't i think it was more a uh, function of him being used as a tool mm. and that was the focus of the Borg's use of him mm. and that he did not have time to for his brain to be able to accept or absorb a lot of the information and it's like I, I think back to first contact when you know obviously he the Enterprise shows up to lead the assault on the cube and he kind of figures out what to do to attack the cube, but he does it more as an instinct than knowledge. And he does it 
you know, after kind of like hearing the collective and like intercepting that information and being able to draw his own conclusion as to what to do. Mm. And I think it's a time thing. And and also that because his body wasn't as dependent on the cybernetics, they were all removed, essentially. True. And if that knowledge she has is stored in some sort of uh, hard drive in her head or something that he would which not. is which ends up like she does have like a hard drive. There's a whole episode about it later. Well, and yeah, There's, still interesting so the, to yes. think that she is the smartest human in the world. And it really makes me start asking questions to myself about what direction are they going to go with the recovering Borg in Picard? Uh, we didn't talk about Picard. I guess there's a new trailer. I didn't watch it. I'm afraid to watch it. Something about it doesn't say anything at really that extra. Um, I think that the, the only interesting thing that's come out since the main trailer for it was that they released an image of what Hugh looks like like the actor and like in his makeup and he looks pretty rad. Like he's deborged, you know, he's got, he, he looks, he looks like the way you would expect him to, which is that he's m- more residually Borgy than seven of nine, but still like mostly human looking. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I would imagine his story might be very similar to seven of nines in the, in the capacity sense. He was coming from a very similar position. Sure. As far as like long-term Borg status. But anyways, so seven of nine is the smartest human in the world and anything that has ever been assimilated. uh, She has access to those memories. Um, Some big foreshadowing there. So we we cut to the bridge uh, because there's, they hit a space bump and they're trying to figure out what happened and this is when all of the sensor displays on the ship go out and then return but are displaying only a giant blue greek omega symbol this is very strange no one knows what's happening no one can access the information chakotay starts to panic a little bit and that's when captain janeway shows up on the bridge says don't panic. Uh, reroute all of the sensor information to my ready room. And I'm not going to tell you about what's happening. This seems like a real fuck you if, uh, I don't know, Voyager was in the middle of a space battle or running away from any of the dozens of people they've had to run away from or any of their normal operations just to come across a little pocket of something interesting in the ship to automatically just lock itself down and come to a complete stop. Yeah, what if Janeway was dead? But what'd they do? No one would know what the fuck to do. No one has codes. Like, Chakotay's in charge. He's the captain. Would, like, when he gets the command codes as a consequence, would the computer, like, play a briefing for him? Like, the like a letter left in the desk by the ex-president for the new one? You're like, hey, buddy. I would... Yeah. I would assume based on... Well, no, it was, um... Uh, oh, geez. What was the little robot's name? The Disney Pixar movie, Eve. Wally? Wally. Remember the, the, the steamboat captains? They all got their little briefing. Oh, and that's true. Event, you're seeing this, you know, Earth is fucked up. Don't ever go back to Earth. Just stay up in the stars. Hello, Captain Chakotay. <laughs> <laughs> we have no. this briefing for you. <laughs> No, I think uh, in reality, what would happen is that uh, they just get Neelix or any other asshole on the ship to just bypass all the top level Starfleet security (laughs) stuff and and go as normal. We do see that the situation is serious enough that Kathy Janeway locks a fucking door. Yeah, I mean, that's how, you know, shit is absolutely serious. I was going to save this for a mess hall, but I want to bring it up here because this is a prime time to discuss it. Um. We jump back to vis-a-vis where the, uh, what was his name? Smeagol? Smell? Smeth? Seth? Meth? What was his name? <laughs> I, like Sme- I like Smeagol before. <laughs> Nasty's voyages. <laughs> <laughs> he breaks into the the control panel over by Seven and Nine's place, right? By just scanning his his iPad his, and it like unlocked yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Which is more than anybody else ever has to do to bypass their systems. I think in my head, I'm going to make it canon that in the post-scarcity utopia 
of the Federation that everybody is just so happy they've become complacent. Most people are satisfied just knowing that I shouldn't be in here and leaving well enough alone. And as a result, Federation just has really shitty security encryption protocols because most people aren't testing it. Whereas like the fucking Romulans that are just treason and treachery all over the place probably have really great security protocols because people are trying to break into shit all the time and and you've had to get better to keep yourself secure. Assign some of the rationale for these these plot holes to that, but I, it's I think we know the real reason. Sure. Real reason is when if if you're you stocks <laughs> If you're dealing with a, a society with super technology, uh, they have to like have just kind of fuck things up for any plot to happen. Yeah. You know, like Ron Moore bitches about like teleporters and replicators and shit like that all the time. Like, how do I make an interesting plot for a society that never runs out of anything? and can just magically bam from place to place. Like, uh, why did this security hack thing work? I don't know. Well, it's kind of just didn't. Well, from here forward, I'm going to say that. Know. The Federation's just known to have shitty security. Uh, I like that encryption. cannon. I like that Ed cannon. I, I I think that's a good ice. Like they're just so complacent because they live they're in this perfect nice. utopia that they don't think of theft because no one in their society steals anything anymore. So why would you steal things? Why are you such a bad person? Uh, but yeah, so the ship comes to a complete stop. Everybody's like, "What is this weird symbol? Nobody knows the Greek alphabet anymore." Uh, and Janeway disappears off to her ready room. Now, I don't remember exactly when it is she tells people, hey, keep this chill. Please, please do not start spreading rumors. But that gets ignored. And that is my biggest takeaway from this episode, I think, is the we've talked about, you know, what a ship of rumors Voyager must be, but when you're dealing with like some top end, the captain told me to shut the fuck up about this. And there's only seven of us I know. And all seven of us have to go out and run our fucking mouth. Like, wow, what, what yeah, a was problem. A, a open contempt for the idea of not talking about it. Uh, so Janeway goes through a whole bunch of, you know, security protocols with a computer. The computer tells her that something called the Omega phenomenon has occurred a couple of like, years away. And, that whatever the Omega directive is, uh, all other priorities are to be ignored and she is to pursue dealing with this issue. As we will later find out, this is such a big deal that the prime directive does not apply. And uh, given that the prime directive is the prime directive it is the guiding light and principle of all of Starfleet. Uh, this is an obvious attempt to really like, paint this as the most serious thing i think they do a good job of explaining why it is uh you know the idea of space travel ending is absolutely something that probably like i don't fucking care what your civilization's doing you can't fuck it up for the rest of us therefore we will interfere to stop this i like that idea that this is the thing that's more important than that and it takes something this serious to, for that to occur uh, i don't have a problem with the premise at all I know some people do in like serious Trek nerd circles. I don't. I wonder how much discussion went into this. Voyager has done a lot of wild things. Uh, uh, the trans warp episode threshold specifically where you have broken, you know, the warp 10 barrier like these. You you break the core realities of Star Trek like stuff like threshold just gets thrown out completely and they pretend it never happened. Like when you're sitting there and saying we are going to, this is the only time in however, you know, many decades of Trek that we are going to suspend the prime directive. Like, do you, do you need to go and get like Rick Berman's personal permission to let something like that happen? <laughs> do you, do you have to do a seance with a ghost of Gene Roddenberry? Yeah. Must the spirit of Gene bless this endeavor? Yeah. It's uh. It's definitely a big deal. Uh, it could be no. I, I would love to know if like someone at an like EVP level had to like go to someone like Berman to get an OK to do this or what. Like how much the story team that kept the continuity of Berman era Trek like had to be consulted by like the writers that pitched this. 
Um, this is a Lisa Kink joint, FYI. Surprise, surprise, because there's no awkward sex in it at all. I was shocked. This might be the name. first Lisa Kink like entry with with zero weird sexual tension in it. So she's got uh, herself hold in there, and the rumors start to speculate around the ship as to what's going on. Um, we have the information already that Anyone who has ever been assimilated by the Borg has instantly spilled all of their secrets to the collective. And there were many ships at Wolf 359 and around the rest of the pre-359 adventures. And as a result, there have been many Starfleet captains that have been assimilated. Ergo, Seven of Nine knows exactly what's going on. And she gets clued into that fact when they're having their like, hey, here's all the stuff the captain wants you to do. And they have their rent, their their standard. But we should know more. And Chakotay's like, I don't feel fucking know more and just go do your jobs. And they're all like, we will. But we're still going to keep talking about it, even though you asked us not to. What we already mentioned. But at that point, they hear about they, they mention the this idea of the quote unquote Omega directive, because some people do apparently know the Greek alphabet and saw the Omega symbol that gets her attention real fast. She's like, I'm sorry, you said what? And then that's when Chicote says, Hey, the captain wants to talk to you because Janeway has made the same assumption, which is, well, a whole bunch of Starfleet captains have been assimilated as a consequence of Borg's actions. So there's a likely strong likelihood that seven of nine knows what this is. And as we will find out, Janeway has decided that she can either lock seven of nine up, or she can make her help uh, because of that. So she goes to the office and they have a conversation about her knowledge. She confirms this hypothesis that she knows because of Borg assimilation of of people who had the security information and start to talk about what it is. And that's when we hear like what it is, which is say it's a particle. We don't hear about why it's so dangerous aside from its explosive potential. Uh, but we understand it's a particle called the uh, the Omega Molecule. Or 010, as the Borg like to call it. Um, and I just had a side thought here. Like, Janeway's got someone in her crew now that knows more than she does, has access to more stuff. Like, what, what a fucking liability. Like, the more you learn mm. about Seven, just the more of a bad idea it was to ever bring her. She doesn't <laughs> listen. She has yes. flag officer knowledge and clearance and, and detailed workings of Starfleet and everything else. And this childlike lack of fucks to give about anything. You said before she's got options on how to handle uh, seven of nine on this. You know, after the fucking debacle with uh, uh, who are those assholes, the, the Herogen and species eight eighty seven, like... <laughs> When she was like, yeah, this is stupid. I'm just going to teleport Space Mewtwo the fuck up out of here, even though you told me not to, and save all of our lives. And then Janeway got all stank with her, and she's like, yeah, fuck you, you made the wrong call. Like, this has been this insubordinate, disruptive force that Janeway has absolutely fostered. Um, now you're dealing with the Omega Particle. As soon as Seven of Nine started, like, giving her any pushback at all, I'd be like, you know, you're going to go chill out in the brig for a little bit. I'm not, I'm not having a repeat of you betray my trust and fuck me over but <clears throat> and, and like and guess what fucking spoiler alert at the end of this goddamn episode what the fuck happens seven of nine like flashes her ass and be like well you know what i'm just gonna fucking betray you anyway because i fucking can mm, does she yeah like yeah she does she threatens to betray her like i'm just gonna do it anyway i'm just gonna like take the molecule and like make it perfect and happy and i'm not gonna destroy it like you want me to and then like she talks her out of not betraying her oh, yeah. like you know but like again like it, it was once again the galaxy is imperiled by the fact that seven of nine is in- insubordinate as fuck but anyway, we're not there yet. Where we're at is they're having a conversation about it. And, you know, we hear from Seven of Nine that, like, the Borg tried to synthesize the particle and it lasted for, like, a trillionth of a second and 600,000 drones died in the explosion. Vessels, which, to be fair, as we've been brought to understand through the uh, events of uh, Season 3 finale... No big deal. Okay, you could throw no. 60 cubes at one ship and have them all get fucked up. And, you know, let's call it a Wednesday. 
I mean, it's it's no adventure with the space Mewtwo's. Those guys are just like lining up and spitting them out. This is this is a minor loss in in any in any universe where the species eight four seven two attacks on the Borg and was it it was thirty three or was it sixty cubes that went down? It's thirty five, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Because this feels like this was important enough that I made an episode title out of it. It was. I've tried to forget. Okay, so, forgive me. So you're saying 35. Hold on. It was 15. Oh, it was 15, 15 Death cubes? Star jabronis. It was 15 cubes. OK, well, let's assume that that never happened. Yeah. 29 Borg ships and 600,000 drones. That's a big fucking deal. So uh, like we've alluded to before, the Borg are they have a big crush on this Omega particle. Oh, one oh, they view it as perfection. There's some real there's some real double talk that starts going on because for all of seven of nine's disregard for religion and uh, that sort of sentiment, that's exactly the feelings she starts laying down here. Uh, And she really, 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 even though she's not Borg anymore, it's like built into her DNA that she wants to understand this thing. She wants to perfect it. She wants to just rub it in her face. And Janeway's like, look, that can't happen. We need to destroy this thing. It's too dangerous and you're with me or you're against me on it. And finally, seven to nine just says, you know what? This thing's so important. Any any interaction I have with it's better than no interaction. So fine, I'll help you destroy it. So the process to do this continues to be secret. And we get a series of scenes where like Janeway wants like super anti rad you know, medication. She wants like Rad X plus. <laughs> the doctors like know that shit's dangerous. I shouldn't give it to you. Like, can I interest like you that. In some with jet. <laughs> Tuvok and Harry Kim are making like a super torpedo that's got like a a more explosive yield. I do found it funny. So they're talking about the uh, photon torpedo having a fifty isoton uh, warhead, and then that would be enough to blow up a small planet. There is a tremendous amount of inconsistency when it comes to the isoton, like what it is, because uh, it's used as both a measurement of mass and a measurement of energy. And uh, as a measurement of energy, a like a normal photon torpedo, I think is like 25. So it would really only be like, you know, two torpedoes. At this, at this strength, that's it's, math. It's math not enough to blow my head. I, it's I, not enough to blow up a planet, is what I'm saying. Like, they needed to to up, increase that by like a factor of ten to start being getting into like, you know, a uh, a torpedo like maybe having that kind of power. But I I noticed this because I've looked at this before as to what an isoton is. And it's just one of those words they use without understanding what it means, without any kind of consistency. And as a cross track, this is not just the Voyager problem. So behind the scenes on this, when the Omega directive is issued to a captain, when the ship sensors pick up uh, the conditions that would be the result of the presence of Omega particles, Federation protocol is that the ship stops and the captain reaches out to Starfleet command and says, hey, psst send them out and a cleanup crew, a a dedicated task force is supposed to come out and handle all this shit themselves. Now, obviously they're out in the middle of the Delta quadrant. So that option's not on the table at which point it becomes the captain's responsibility to clean this mess up. So she's not really trained well for what's going on or what needs to happen here. And all of this working in secrecy is kind of building a really sloppy solution to what is, uh, you know, an alpha level threat to the existence of the Federation. Um, we see more and more of the crew starting to spread rumors, uh, which again, I mean, there's been several assertions by command at this point, like just keep your mouth shut, keep your head down work. Uh, during the Tuvok, Harry Kim scene, Harry speculates that it's uh, that someone else thinks that eight, four, seven, two is starting to reemerge, which again is, so wild to see Voyager drawing on its own past. It would have been cool to have Harry say, oh, God, I hope I don't get alien snot all up my nose again. <laughs> Whatever. Nearly get me off the show. Yeah. But uh, 
I, I thought that was a lot of fun world building there, seeing, you know, what that rumor mill is. But it, it just comes back down to like, is it asking so much for the captain who very rarely lays a lot on to say, listen, this is super fucking important. Just shut up and work and, and keep your mouth shut. And instead, it's like it it's as loose of a secret at this point as the coworker murder simulator that made its rounds back in worst case scenario, where even the doctor's hearing rumors about it. And nobody likes talking to the doctor. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Eventually, the like the logical conclusion gets reached, I think, in like the next scene we're going to talk about. But this is where I start to kind of hit the wall on the episode. The fact that Janeway needs to be convinced by Chakotay that, you know, maybe she should tell them what the fuck is going on so they can all like deal with this obviously very serious problem, you know, as a team <laughs> rather than like half ass it because no one wants to fucking talk about it and then send the captain and seven to nine off on a essential suicide mission. Yeah, they're going to go do this super in a sh- torpedo shuttle like they thought there was one omega particle. There's instead of a collection and Janeway finally realizes like the resources of one shuttle is not going to be enough. I should be bringing the entire crew on this. I need all of Voyager's resources. And she was going to bring all of Voyager to do it. It takes Chicote to convince her, I should tell you all what I'm doing. And that's what I don't understand. Like, why is it that Catherine Janeway is not possessed of the self-awareness to know of like, man, this shit is serious. There's no one to help. I probably shouldn't risk space travel in the entire Delta Quadrant on my personal capacity to get the job done. I should probably involve my ship and come to and think my of crew. It, come to think of it. Uh, I try to blow the ship up every other episode. Anyways, we're probably all going to die out of here. OK, well, you know, dead men tell no tales. Sure. Hey, guys, let me tell you about the Omega Particle. The Omega Particle is this thing that we know about because 100 years ago, some Federation scientists looking to make uh, super energy made this thing and it blew the fucking research station apart. And uh, on top of being like a mega nuke that killed a ton of people, it also ripped subspace a new butthole. And now there's a whole sector of space called like the Lynn Prulu sector or something where you cannot go warp drive through it at all. And Tom's like, well, I know about that. I thought that was a naturally occurring phenomenon. And Janeway's like, nope, that's actually space Chernobyl. So this is, I think, a classic uh, sci-fi idea. And it's so cool for Star Trek because so infrequently is like the boundaries of science a problem, like something too dangerous to know. Uh, And this is a perfect threat. The idea of... The space Chernobyl is that warp drive doesn't work. And if warp drive doesn't work, interstellar civilization does not happen anymore. And so obviously none of us can afford for that to happen. Therefore, none of us can ever afford to research this further because the consequences of failure are so intense. Uh, They've used this uh, idea in a Star Trek video game that I cherish for all the wrong reasons. Did you ever play Star Trek Legacy? No. It is a Bethesda published game. I don't know if they developed it. They published it uh, in mid 2000s. It was a big deal because all of the Star Trek cap it was the very first thing that all of the Star Trek captains like contributed to. That was a, an official Star Trek property thing. Like all of them voice their characters on it. And uh, the plot was written, I think, by D.C. Fontana, who just recently passed. Uh, It was original series writer. And it's a story that crosses all of the generations of this, basically this mad Vulcan scientist that fucks around with shit she shouldn't fuck around with. And, like, she gets involved with the Borg and it's all this other stuff. And, like, it starts in the Enterprise era and goes all the way to past the end of Nemesis. And, uh the Omega particle stuff is part of it. And the game suggests that the author of the Omega uh, uh, directive is James Kirk because he personally witnesses space Chernobyl and that the story that Janeway gives here is a cover story that the scientist that did it was this Vulcan and it wasn't done like, Oh, oops, I accidentally blew up the station. It was oops. I was using it as a, as a fucking weapon and did this. And so I which I thought was always neat that the that they had the idea to do that. Seven hints 
or offers an alternative because Janeway says they were doing energy research. Um, uh, Seven, who, to be fair, has just as much knowledge, if not more on all of this than Janeway says, or they were doing weapons research. I was really hoping through this that this was a continuation of an old original series plot. I thought that would have been cool as fuck. I was very sad to see that this was the, you know, vo- this Voyager episode was the origin of this entire story and that there's no yeah. previous. Uh, maybe Discovery season three will go there. God forbid they they tell an engaging story. <laughs> um, we know that won't happen. They're 900 but, years in the future now. <laughs> uh, the video game I want to talk about, you're talking about this legacy. I want to talk about Mass Effect. Because that okay. is why this was really like such an oh shit moment for me, because that's exactly what happens at the end of Mass Effect 3, which go ahead and jump forward 15 minutes from now if you haven't played Mass Effect and you think you ever will, because we're going down the Mass Effect hole. But, you know, they do have faster than light engines, but galactic civilization is spread out way further than it is in Star Trek to the point where you would not be able to travel between the the species uh, solar systems on just faster than light transport. You need these mass effect relays, which are like jump gates and fling vessels, m- massive, massive amounts of distance. Uh, and at the end, all of the mass effect relays are overloaded and blow up. And I'm like, wow, the entire landscape of this entire video game, this very rich story that they've told has all completely collapsed. And if you were a Torian hanging out on Earth or... Yeah, because, you know, the yeah, the 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 Citadel ends up at Earth to try and right. wreck your ship. But it's like all of these Torians and Krogan and and Nasari, they're all just trapped there forever and they will never, ever, ever see their friends or family again. And just civilization, as you know, it has completely changed. And to think how that might apply to the Federation if you will never see the Romulans or the Klingons again and every single starship out there is now in um, Voyager's predicament. And if you were in a... But worse, like they could be between star systems and then never able to get to anything again, let alone a habitable planet. They just die out there. Yeah. I mean, the people are going to be island in a a sea of stars. Uh, Civilization, interstellar civilization essentially comes to an end because no one can travel the distances. And, uh, yeah, it would be catastrophic tor- for the the movement of society. Uh, and I, 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 I agree, like, it's so much, it's so interesting to talk about the end of Mass Effect 3 because they had to retcon that ending so hard. Like, the, the thing that you're talking about is what the ending initially, like, left you with, and then they had to, like, go back later <laughs> and redo the endings to suggest that in fact all the mass effect relays didn't actually blow up they're just they just needed to be they're fixed and everyone went home at the end you know like because they were going to strand all of the galaxies like like get shit done people at earth <laughs> at the end <laughs> where everyone's go to earth and just like eat all the humans i guess because it's, it's nothing else uh but yeah, I, for the as a threat for the Federation to get us back on track, um, and for the for the galaxy as a whole, as portrayed through Star Trek, the idea of the collapse of interstellar travel, I think, is a great threat. It is the and, best threat, the- and it is it's somewhat somewhat surprising it took till now to ever really do that. The closest I ever got was a TNG episode with the interstellar speed limits, but. That wasn't quite the level of threat that this was. I would say that on the threat scale that, yeah, I mean, this is a perfect use of this in this Omega Directive because the most dangerous thing prior to that was the Borg, which we've harped on excessively because Janeway threw in with them to fight Species 8472 or whatever. Um, But yeah, I I think collapsing warp travel uh, is a fate worse than universal assimilation agreed i think it would be for the federation specifically i would really kill them and spiritually and uh this gets conveyed everyone now knows what's up everyone understands the problem everyone starts working on a solution and 
you know, solution one is they basically blow it up. Solution two is uh, something that seven of nine comes up with, uh, which is essentially a giant glowy orb that they would put the molecule molecules into and will dissolve the bonds in it. So that kind of harmlessly dissipates. That's like the other option that they have available to them. And seven of nine up to this point seems like she's kind of on board with, I will follow orders and destroy this. Although, uh, you know, she's very seven of nine about it. Um, they wind up, uh, arriving on station where they found the molecules and it's clear from the fact that subspace has been shredded here that they've already had some problems and they get to the facility where all the experimentation's going on and it's like half blowed the fuck up. It's from, straight up Chernobyl, man, because the middle yeah. reactor area is just blowing like blue radiation out of the top and you see all these scorch marks pushing outwards. I, I got a question about the framing in this scene because they roll up on the planet where there is a pre-warp civilization. And then there is a lunar research base on the moon. The aliens doing the experiment, are they the same aliens who are living on the planet? Or are these aliens that just set up here and like fuck the cavemen living down on the, the surface? I assume they're the same civilization because the uh, you know, their whole idea is they're going to escape from them by going to warp. And it also like they they have subs you know sublight ships. That's why they don't understand that they're blowing up subspace. I that's the interpretation I took. I guess they could be different. I didn't know if they were supposed to be or not. To be honest, let's jump to the end for one moment to to feel that out because if this species can't jump to warp then in the end when they finally jettison this thing and and blow it up those two ships that were chasing them should have both died as well right and i don't think correct they do it's weird whatever so there's this there's this lunar research yeah, it's 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 sloppy at the end i think you're right there's this chernobyl listen man because I, <laughs> I went back and listened to the uh space pipes uber alice uh, talk about sloppy fucking writing when Janeway blows up the fucking yeah man and if she blew up uh, sick bay she should have also blown the doctor up because his main thing is in there and he wasn't walking around with his little hollow projector thing so there's a lot of liberties taken in that and there's a little a lot of liberties taken in this one as to who is Janeway murdering at any particular time Uh, but they yeah, sh shit ain't good right there, there's someone on the planet surface. There's someone on the planet, the moon. Uh, they go in. Janeway says, uh, get the sick bay ready. We're going to bring you bringing in some radiation burn dudes. Uh, Tom, please go get radiation poisoning. And anyone else who wants to go have their hair fall out, they beam down to the surface. Uh, we've got some real half ass industrial accident set pieces going on. Unfortunately, there's no K's on hanging half out of the wall because of a microwave. I mean, if you're not impressed, then it's clearly not a good industrial accident. No, not again. Yeah. Chernobyl really has set a new bar for industrial accident, special effects, makeup. Um, they find out that, yes, they've been uh, experimenting on it. He says they still have some of the particles on site. Uh, they teleport them up. Meanwhile, while Janeway's dealing with this personally down on the moon surface, she has left seven of nine in charge of getting this containment retirement unit built. And we've got some real sloppy storytelling here about what is Starfleet willing to endure because the captain said so. Do we ever, I was such an, a fucking eye roll. She sets everyone up in a collective cause I guess she can and like assigns them designations and Everyone apparently is okay with this, except Harry Kim, <laughs> the lady so... who is not Starfleet or Maquis or in a uniform, no. the mm -hmm. lady in a cat suit who mm -hmm. is a fucking Borg telling people that you is correct. are two of 10 and three of six, and you will do this 
and blah, blah, blah. And then, like you said, Harry Kim goes up and says, uh, hey, Chakotay, this isn't cool. She's trying to turn us into the Borg. And Chakotay is like, well, you know, apparently I forgot about how I tried to blow her out of a fucking airlock because I'm so anti-Borg, even though I've been co-opted once by the Borg and have a real hair up my ass about this. I'm cool. Just, you know, win in Rome, Harry. Win in Borg. Borg it up. Gotta learn to co-opt. <laughs> Gotta take, take it from me, buddy. I take a page of the El Chicote handbook, man. You gotta gotta learn when just to take what's handed to you and immediately shift your loyalties to it he for took a unknown reasons. Page out of the Frangies books and False Prophets and uh charged him as he handed him a copy of uh uh co opting for of, dummies. <laughs> the rules of co opting. Uh so whatever. It was so bad. It's such a weird tangent to go on right now, too. Did not belong in the story at all. Like, no. she's off her fucking rocker, and the fact that Chicote is putting up with any of that bull, or any of them are putting up with any of that bullshit, like, she's giving them slave names. Like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's legit. Your name is we two about- of ten. Get the fuck out of here, crazy lady. Yeah, I- we we are finally arrived at a point in the episode where I need to tell a story. So, they're on the surface. Uh... This is, by the way, when Janeway makes it clear that the prime directive does not apply, but that feels right at this point, like that it shouldn't. And they open up the containment unit that the aliens have built that contain the rest of the Omega particles. And Janeway is talking about, you know, needing to destroy it. Whereas Tuvok, this is his first kind of opportunity to see it, is like, well, it's a shame we can't study it, you know. This is also it's, Tuvok's first time to talk to someone who is not a subordinate. Like, I get him shutting down Harry Kim, even though he says, yes, I am kind of curious. And I think uh, Tim Russ in this episode, like this scene specifically, he gets my best acting award because his face acting through this little exchange they have is a plus. Yeah, because his like inner Vulcan's like, ooh, this seems real fucking interesting. And he starts to, you know, suggest that very thought. And uh, Janeway's like, no, we're blowing this shit up. You know, we're never going to have this opportunity again. And hopefully and she says, like, hopefully we never fucking will again. And Tuvok's like taken aback and says, that's a, a strange statement to hear from a woman of science. Which, of course, Janeway is a science officer in her past. And she says, well, I'm also a woman who knows her limits. Okay. These are words that escape my head. her. Look at my face. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. So this happens. I'm watching this episode with Stevie, and she immediately like throws down. Like she had this. She, you know, she's watching with me. She's paying attention. She's got her iPad and that sort of thing. You know, and kind of chilling. Typical she wife's activity that. during Star Trek. Right. She's been paying attention the whole episode. But, you know, kind of doing other stuff. And she says, wait, wait, what? What? And she's like, roll that back. So I roll it back like 20 seconds. And she hears it again. And she hears the line. And she literally like throws the iPad down on the couch and goes, what? What? She's like, he, she yells it. He's like, yeah, and, she, and she went into launch this whole tirade. Like, I, I, I remember watching an episode of Dr. Phil where a, a woman was on Dr. Phil and said that she had a recipe for mac and cheese that was just as delicious as normal mac and cheese that used crushed cashews instead of cheese. And I thought that was the most mad I'd ever be in my whole life from hearing a lie. But it is not. It is right fucking now. Now is the time I am the most mad I've ever heard a lie. It's like, bitch, are you for real? You constantly don't know your limits. Your entire existence is defined by your inability to understand and your limits people have died on your ship repeatedly because you have no conception whatsoever of your limits you should be thrown out of the ship in a million uh, uh fucking uh revolutions from your own crew members who should have rioted against you because you don't know your limits and now now you're gonna say you're gonna know you liar you filthy liar she just i was so proud Peter to see such apocalyptic rage. I I didn't strike me nearly as bad 
as it struck her, she was just the abs- beside herself with rage. In this episode, her dialogue makes perfect sense. This is the Janeway that should be, right? This is a common sense Janeway who wants to do something but knows better not to. And then you've got Scorpion Part 1 Janeway. Where Chakotay says, you don't know your own limits. And she acknowledges she doesn't know her own limits. And then she gets in bed with the Borg. And all of the other crazy, terrible shit she does. Because, like you said, she does not respect limits. She is not a character that is defined by limits. And yes, this is, while this is the the better version, the version of Janeway that I wish they'd write, this is not the stupid, reckless Janeway that we have uh, been told is is the true Janeway. Uh, it's still a cool scene. Put, putting those words in her mouth now just feels so silly. Yeah, but I agree with you, and it's probably why I was not as mad about it as Stevie was. Is that I get what they were going for for this episode? It made sense in the context of this episode. The problem is, it just makes no fucking sense in the context of every other episode. And this is this is the life we have chosen for ourselves. Yeah. So you can choose to either hate the continuity, which is that Janeway does does never knows her limits and would not be like in claiming that she does is silly or accept the episode essentially as a moment in time and say, well, it makes sense now. There's this thing going on in the background where seven of nine is like, listen, Uh, I've got all these Borg experiments that we've done. Plus she goes and like interrogates the lead researcher and is like, Hey, tell me about this thing. He's like, Oh, we use the things own harmonics. And she's like, Hey, that's a great idea. We never thought to do that, which jives because the Borg are thieves and not innovators. Right. And Hey, that makes perfect sense. I think we could make our other experiments work now. Hey, Chakotay. I think we can, instead of destroying these things, I think that we can, unlock the potential and do great stuff with it and he's like well i'll run it by the captain but i don't think she's going to go for it whatever um so there's this mounting pressure that there is a legitimate way to not have to destroy these things which again janeway would normally capitalize on but in this case she's like no omega directive stands start transporting the stuff up to the ship and we're going to put it in the uh, containment chamber and start retiring it at some point alien ships appear there was an exchange of dialogue towards the end of uh, Seven's interrogation of the lead researcher. And she's like, yeah, we're going to destroy this thing. He's like, no, that is my life's work. My civilization is going to fall apart and die, which is conveniently never mentioned again. Yep. We are all going Not to die. Not even given a name. Yeah, no, yeah. we're just dead. Just just Talaxians waiting to die on the surface of our planet to something horrible. It's like, please don't do this. She's like, yeah, well, we're going to do it. And he's like, well, we're going to stop you. So we get this chase sequence that happens where they got to beam all the particles up into the storage bay that seven of nine has made. And they're going to try and fly away from this research facility while killing off these particles. It's at this point that we get a, an interesting look at what the Federation has become in this moment. And that is like, the technocracy basically from mage ascension where there is this group of super scientists that decide who gets to do what and at what time. And if you deviate from that schedule, if you become a reality deviant, they will come in and fuck your shit up and take away your toys. And that is exactly what happens. And I thought it was interesting. Um, They get into this high speed chase (laughs) Which explain to me the physics on this one. You're a numbers guy. Subspace. <laughs> I can't. Fucked. I right. There's no warp speed. That's correct. Maybe these guys are a pre warp civilization and these ships are coming from the surface. Right. Or maybe right. these aliens are from somewhere else and they're just experimenting on the moon because who cares about the cave people living down on that planet. Right. Regardless, nobody can go to warp. There's two ships. They're far away from Voyager. They're getting closer. Voyager puts the shit on the ship. Voyager flies away. Voyager can't go warp. They can't go warp. The fastest you can go is full impulse. Right? Right. The ships start to overtake Voyager. 
<laughs> yes. I, I had the exact same moment of this logic does not make sense. N- neither because a, even if you assume like the relativity, right? There is a limit, a uh, pre light speed limit that both ships would run up against. Uh, and you would assume Voyager is fully capable of reaching that limit no matter what. Right. Sure. Uh, I, so how is it that they'd overtake? Now, I think that you could create a reason within the logic of the episode, which is that these ships that are in this area that are created by the civilization are better like suited for they think they don't understand that they're breaking subspace because they don't go to warp. Like if the idea is that they're the pre-warp civilization. Well, they don't understand warp. They don't understand subspace and they just know that kind of shit's wonky when you space travel. So their ships are designed to like deal with these eddies and these like little little speed bumps. So while Voyager like speed dips because they're dealing with the bumpy ride, they're just like cruising, right? And so that's why they're overtaking them. There's an explanation. Here's another uses explanation. the logic of the is, episode. We've just moved all these crazy chaos particles on the ship and it's wreaking havoc with our systems. Right. And we can't go fast. Two great yes. explanations. Uh, we get zero. Neither are given. Yes. Neither are used. They just overtake him. So now we've got a situation where to retire these particles with the 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 gas chamber that they've made is going to take an hour and they only have half an hour before these ships are up on their ass so jane was like well let's just uh let's overclock this gas chamber and seven's like that's not good it's going to cause these problems and then jane was like well we'll blow the rest up with that torpedo and it should be good enough and then seven's like or we could do my thing which is like stabilize them and everything will be swell it seems like this really shitty catch-22 situation that they don't need to deal with do things the right way or roll the dice and maybe blow the ship up or use the borg technology and it's like the fourth option if you've already suspended the prime directive and there's these two hostile enemy ships not enemy but alien ships coming up and you have no need to protect them it's either your ship gets blown up your crew dies and you fuck light speed travel or you just blow up those two ships that are chasing you or disable them or do anything to like fight them off they're pre-warp how good could their weapons be and that never crosses and so janeway deals with this like artificial uh timer that doesn't need to be there it's a forced problem at the end of the episode but it's what they come up with they don't provide an explanation for it. it's general like Voyager shitting up the ending and not coming through with an explanation for why things are happening the way they're happening. But the point is just to give it a ticking clock, as you noted. It happens, you know, Seven and Captain Janeway are attempting to eliminate the particles in the cargo bay. And this is a little earlier. uh, uh, Seven of Nine had a conversation with Chakotay about like this being her seeing her God moment. And so she's kind of carrying this more explicitly religious ideal into not wanting to destroy the Omega particle. And, you know, essentially uh, the captain was not having it uh, as as was not interested in the conversation. I always thought it was interesting that, you know, they bring Chakotay into it because he is the spiritual character. They even make note of that. And then uh, um, at 1.7 of nine says, if you could have an opportunity to meet your God, <laughs> wouldn't you take Been it? Been there, done and that. It's like, and it's like it's, what is so cool is like, yeah, I've met my gods. They weren't actually all that interesting. Maybe you should let this go. Like my gods kind of sucked. They were weird aliens from New Jersey. They, 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 they were not what I was hoping. I got naked it's, and everything. Never meet your sucked. heroes. Yeah. yeah. I had to wear a sackcloth. It was, yeah, but, uh, so, uh, they're trying to build this as like Seven's seeing God moment and her having like a spiritual moment. And I just thought it was such a dumb. It was so poorly done. And I'm the guy who loves this shit. I love me some spiritual parallel shit. I will give episodes of Star Trek the benefit of the doubt for trying. And this was just felt so weird and tacked on and underdeveloped. And. It's just like this random thing that seven of nine suddenly is having a religious experience today. And it's, I didn't buy it. This being a religious experience was the wrong way to do it. Her having to fight ingrained conditioning and overthrow. That was much cooler. Overthrow Borg mental 
brainwashing was the story to tell there that she having to realize that this isn't really important to her. And that is the last vestiges of like Borg influence beyond any technology, just this, they, their desire still being imprinted on her. Um, by the end, like I said, uh, these ships are closing in instead of Janeway, just zapping these fools out of the sky. They decide that they're going to overclock the gas chamber, kill half the particles, and then depressurize the cargo bay, blow it out of the back, shoot it with the mega torpedo, and then warp off to safety. Which, again, if these guys don't have warp speed, if they're close enough that they're shooting at her, when they blow it up, they have to go to warp to get the fuck out of there. You're going to kill the ships anyways. These, these guys are dead one way or the other. Yep. Shoot them, disable yes, their ships. Are. Maybe they blow up. Maybe they survive. You limp away and retire these particles safely and give these guys a shot in hell. I mean, you're you're killing them anyways, and you're creating an artifact. Stupid. Like very sloppy. You know, they need to get a 10-year-old. They need to get a 10-year-old into the fucking uh, hold on a sec. Let me see here. There is a document that I have from forever ago and this had to be 1992 i had this thing this is like a aol ford email you know funny little email things right this is called the top 100 things i'd ever do if i ever became an evil overlord Oh, yeah, that's a classic. It is a classic. Number 12, Joe, one of my advisors will be an average five-year-old child. Any flaws in my plan that he is able to spot will be corrected before implementation. If only the Voyager writing room had this and it was the top 100 things I'd do if I ever became a Star Trek Voyager writer. Like, I feel like a lot of the holes that we punch in these plots, they're not the results of 30-something-year-olds with college degrees. It's just like, a five-year-old could say, well, why not do this? And they're just like, just shut up. We're Hollywood. We know better than you. Yeah, none of this stuff is overly complicated. We're not like coming up with, we're not pushing our our glasses upon our bridge of our nose and saying, actually, we are pointing out basic logical flaws in the premise. It's this and the way they rush this stuff feels akin to like some of the bullshit in the latest Star Wars movie. You saw Rise of Skywalker. No, I saw Rise of Skywalker. Not discuss that yet. I'm sure there's people out there. I, I I'm not going to discuss it in any detail or identify anything that happens. But I think we can say, generally speaking, there's a whole shit ton of stuff that happens in that movie that they simply do not provide any explanation for. Not that there's a bad explanation or an underdeveloped explanation or uh, a explanation that we did not personally like, it is simply not explained. And it's stuff like this where it's like, there are ways we could, we talked about ways to solve these problems that use the logic of the episode that require a line of dialogue. We didn't have pre-existing conversation. Like everything, those two options we came up with you and me talking organically, like just get, more than two people in a room and say, hey, does any of this feel weak to you? Is there a part that we missed? Is there something we could cover? They have a red room. It's not one person just cranking these scripts out. Yeah, let's tighten this up. And it just, that process does not exist, I think, for a lot of this stuff. Like, here we are talking about a movie that was released a few weeks ago that probably cost, you know, a half a billion dollars to make and market that they put out there that had a whole bunch of this, right? That they could have solved but didn't. And there's a million reasons why they may not have. But the point is that they released a product so, that had those flaws in it. By the end of this, uh, they're getting ready to jettison the container. Seven looks in the little viewport. The Omega particles naturally align for whatever fucking reason. And she Cause, sees cause, God. Because sure. She sees God for a second. It's looking Seems at great. her. It's like, please don't kill me. I'll play nice. And then they blow it out of there anyways. And presumably blow up the other ships. And off they go. Um, my biggest head scratcher on this. They return all the research staff. And they make their peace and whatever. And it's like, okay, so the aliens were able to synthesize these Omega particles. They've stressed how important it is to them. Aren't these guys just going to fucking do that all over again? 
what if the story here was that Janeway realizes this, Seven realizes this, and now they're forced with the fucking conundrum of like, for us to successfully clean this up, like people are going to have to die. Something is going to have to happen. You're going to have to genocide the civilization. All the researchers are going to have to be rounded up and shot in the head. Like now, now we have a very interesting Star Trek story. Now we talk about the frontier of science and when does Janeway know when to quit? Yeah. What, what if all of this information's on some data bank on that like planet they passed by and they're just going to go back and try it again. You're absolutely right. There's this, this thread that would be way more interesting that now nah, we'll just drop these dudes back off and head home. We did it boys. We got it done. At let's have a talk least, while we're in the Da Vinci. Let's have a Da Vinci uh, hologram talk about Jesus. Yeah. At the very least, have like the doctor f their memories up, so they all come to the conclusion that this is impossible and they should never attempt it again. But they don't do any of that. Um, there is a lot of cool, like I said, thought experimentation in this. A lot of neat. What if? What if Starfleet lost the ability to go faster than light? What if? there was a situation that the Federation deems so dangerous, they're willing to overthrow their most important ideals. What happens to all of the captains and personnel who know about the Omega Directive and the existence of the Omega Particle who quit Starfleet, who run off and join the Maquis, who become bad guys or crazy terrorists or you know whatever some of these nutty uh, admirals get up to? That's, you know, the the secret Star Trek without turning into Section 31, like Starfleet secrets are always very interesting to me. And what happens to those secrets when they leave? Again, I would have liked to TOS tie and I'm glad to hear that there's other media that has interacted with the Omega Particles and the uh, the events at the Lentrine Sector Research Post. Uh, but overall, I'd say it was a strong entry to season four. It's stuff we don't normally get to touch. Like you said, <clears throat> there is a lot of loose ends by the end of this and some real sloppy storytelling that I don't think this episode deserved. It's a brilliant sci-fi premise and poorly executed. And someday I'm going to go back through our catalog of 89 episodes. And I'm going to count how many fucking times I've said that. What do you think it is? 15? 20? Uh, it's real tiring. It's it's real tiring to have to say it again. And it, it it's definitely getting on my nerves. Like it I I I don't want to say like I didn't dread doing the podcast about this. I didn't dread watching it. But as I was watching it, I started to think like, ah, oh, do I have to do how much more of this fucking show am I going to spend the next two years doing this? Am, am I able to do this? <laughs> It's what's interesting, and, and not. I didn't get the hate for seven of that that you had on this one. It had just rubbed me the wrong way, and and I think it's because of the like appropriation of the religion angle. And this is not a knock, by the way, on Jerry Ryan's like performance, which she does as well as she possibly can with like trying to convey this emotion. It's just that it's it's this this season is notorious for how they like go so all in on seven of nine like so hard and this just felt like uh, like so forced uh in comparison to some of the other stuff that they do so i did not enjoy this experience and i look forward to cleansing it out of my mouth hopefully what are we watching next week? i want to say one closing thought your statement that you know there's potential there that's just you know squandered and that's what we, we both say squander potential like Maybe one day down the road, they might reboot. I think there's there's some really cool stuff in Voyager that I wouldn't mind seeing someone else go back and redo and handle the right way. I think the human elements, Voyager hits those notes very well as a crew interacting with itself. But I think as dudes on a ship doing stuff in space, that's important. The The bad writing has ruined many of these stories for no good reason. If it ever got a Battlestar Galactica reboot treatment, I think it'd be really fucking cool. From here, though, uh, we're going to go into season four, episode 22, Unforgettable. And we've got uh, Chakotay talking to what looks like Kess, but is not Kess. 
An alien woman requests asylum aboard Voyager, stating that she had been aboard recently and that she and Chakotay fell in love. Sounds like she got co-opted by Co-opte. Ha <laughs> ha! Got him. Uh, this one, I think this one has a guest star in it that's notable. I mean, I remember the idea of the episode being particularly interesting, so let me look this up. Let me look this up. Yes, this is this does Virginia Madsen. I don't know if you know who she is as an actress. Yeah, she's she's a she's a dude. She's a person that's done things. What's that? She's not Andy Dick. Sold. <laughs> not Andy Dick. Um, but yeah, she she does. A, I remember her doing a really good at job in this episode playing this character. And it's uh, it'll be interesting to watch it again. OK, well. We'll see what happens. Uh, We didn't really have a chance to talk at the beginning, uh, but for those of you out there doing the Patreon thing with us, we did a epic review of the Star Trek Triple X porn parody. Oh, did we? Oh, my God. Hour and a half long. And and I think it was we we really could have gone longer. Um, Some of the most brilliant Trek (laughs) continuity that we've ever seen some of the best Trek writing we've ever seen in terms of just nerdy attention to detail, mm-hmm. uh, all in service to, uh, some, some really, uh, like throwback pornography production, uh, so much to unpack. And, uh, we did it as a thank you to our patrons to give them something special, keeping the lights on around here. So, uh, if you would like to jump on that train, uh subscribe to patreon you can download it now give a listen if that's not something you're able to do totally understand don't worry we will eventually make it available to everybody probably sometime here next month so uh thanks to everybody that uh has been uh kicking in there and hope you enjoyed the episode let us know and we will see everybody next week peace